to Hebrews chapter 2. As we mentioned this morning, the word therefore is a word of conclusion. It's not the beginning of a thought, it's the summarizing now and making the application of the thought. The thought, of course, goes back to chapter 1, where God, in different ways and in different times, spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days has spoken by his own dear son. And the fact that God has spoken directly, that God became man in order to communicate his truth to man. So the plain declaration of God has spoken unto us by his own dear son, whom he has made heir of all things, by whom he created the worlds, who is the express image uh, of him, uh, the outshining of his glory. And uh, unto the Son he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So this is the one who has spoken to us in these last days, the words of Jesus Christ, and the revelation of God that was given to us by Jesus Christ. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. If they gave attention to the word of God that came through the prophets, then surely the word that came directly from Jesus should have precedence over, but yet never contradicting the words of the prophets. And so giving the more earnest heed to the words of Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father but by me. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he that believeth is not condemned. These are the words that we should give the more earnest heed to. Lest at any time we should let them slip, or that we should drift away from the truth. Now, the purpose, it would seem, of the book of Hebrews, it was written to the Hebrews, the Jews who had become believers in Jesus as their Messiah. But tradition has an extremely strong hold on people. And it appears that many of the Jews who had embraced Jesus as their Messiah were still bound by traditions to the Jewish faith. And some of them were drifting away from Jesus back into Judaism. They were going back under the law. Now, the contrast, remember, is the word of God that came through the prophets with the word of God that came directly from God through Jesus, who was God manifested in the flesh. So they were in danger of drifting away from the words of Jesus and being entangled again with the yoke of bondage, the legalism of the law. God does not want a legal relationship with you. God wants a loving relationship with you. And that is made possible through Jesus Christ. 
God drawing us into a loving relationship with himself. Under the law, the relationship was predicated upon man's faithfulness in keeping the law. It was, if thou shalt do these things, I will be a God unto thee, and you will be my people. But the first covenant failed, not because the covenant was not good, but it was because man could not keep it. And thus the failure of the first covenant, which brought in the second covenant. When Jesus gave the cup to his disciples, he said, this is a new covenant. It's in my blood, which was shed for the remission of sins. And in this new covenant, our relationship with God is not based upon our faithfulness, but it is based upon God's faithfulness to keep his word. And so through Jesus Christ, we relate to God by faith, faith in Jesus and in the fact that he paid the price to redeem us from the power of sin. So we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard from the lips of Jesus, lest at any time we should drift away or drift back under the bondage of the law. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, the word angels is literally messengers. We usually think of it as divine messengers, but it is not necessarily so. Anybody who was a messenger was called in Angelus an angel. He is a messenger. Now, the angels did bring, at times, rarely, but at times, they did bring God's message. An angel appeared to Gideon, you remember. An angel of the Lord wrestled with Jacob. And there were times when God used angels as messengers to communicate unto man his truth. But also the prophets who were messengers of God, though they were not divine, yet they were inspired by God and were messengers and were called angels. Jesus, in writing to the churches, the seven churches of Asia in the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3 addresses the ministers as angels to the angel of the church of Ephesus right and the angel being the messenger to the church and so not divine human messengers bringing God's message to God's people. So the word spoken by angels would be a reference to the Old Testament scriptures given to us by the prophets. God who at different times and in different ways spoke to our fathers by the prophets who are here called the angels. And if the word that was spoken by the angels was steadfast, it is certain, it is sure, And every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. God laid out the rules. God laid out the punishment for the infraction of the rules. And every transgression and disobedience received a fair recompense of reward. The judgments that were meted out for the violations of the law of God. Then how shall we escape? If, if that word was certain, if it came to pass, and as you read, surely it did come to pass. Read the prophets, read Jeremiah, read Isaiah, read Ezekiel. Read the warnings that they gave to the people. How that they warned them that if they would continue in their sins in the worship of the other gods, that God would judge them and he would lead them into captivity. And, and it came to pass. The word that was spoken by the prophets was fulfilled. And their transgressions and disobedience brought 
the judgment of the Babylonian captivity and the Assyrian captivity and the defeat before their enemies. If that was certain, the word spoken by the prophets, how much more then the word spoken by Jesus and how shall we then escape the judgment of God, the wrath of God, if we neglect this great salvation. First of all, there is no escape. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? There is no escape. The judgment of God is certain. The word of God is sure. As in Hebrews 10, 25, that certain fearful looking for the fire indignation and the wrath of God which will devour his adversaries. The certain looking for. There is no escape. And a person is living in a lie if he thinks that somehow he is going to escape the judgment of God. If he thinks that he can hide from God, there is no escape. God has provided only one way of escape, and that is through Jesus Christ and the great salvation that we have through him. There's only one way by which you and I can escape the damnation of hell. And that is by the provision that God has made through his son. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. If any man tries to come any other way, Jesus said he is as a thief and a robber. There is one way to God. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is death. Jesus provided the way by which we can have our sins forgiven and by which we can come into fellowship with God but there is no other way. The cross declares this very clearly. The fact that Jesus went to the cross tells us that there is no other way to be saved. In the garden, facing the cross, he prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, thy will be done. If it is possible, if what is possible, if the redemption of man, if salvation is possible, by man being good, by man keeping rules, by man being religious, let this cup pass from me. And the fact that he went to the cross, drank the cup, declares loud and clear it's not possible for man to be saved except by the cross of Jesus Christ. When the rich man went away sorrowful when he heard the demands of Jesus, and Jesus then turned to his disciples and said how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he sort of modified, he said, how difficult it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were rather shocked. They said, oh Lord, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. The question, 
Who can be saved? The answer, with man it is impossible. All of your best efforts cannot save you. As Paul cried out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then he said, thanks be unto God through Jesus Christ. But that's the only way. And if you neglect the great salvation, there is no escape. The salvation is great because it's open to everybody. Whosoever will may come and partake of the water of life freely. Whosoever believeth in him. That all that will come to him, he will in no wise cast out. So it's, it's great because it doesn't exclude a single person. Anyone, no matter how laden with sin, no matter how guilty they are, can come to Jesus Christ and will find forgiveness. Now, you know, there are some people that get upset over this. Uh, the man by the name of Bundy, who was a serial killer and who had killed so many people, while he was there on death row, accepted Jesus Christ. And when he was put to death, he spoke of his assurance of having received the forgiveness of God because he had accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And so I think it was Dr. Dobson who was there with him and afterwards said, well, you know, he paid for his crimes with his death but he's with the Lord in heaven because he had put his trust in Jesus. That created quite a uproar. People did not want to think that Bundy could be in heaven. They were upset. Letters to the editors all over the country were, you know, upset that Dobson would say that a man like that could be in heaven, you know, and, and all, that God would forgive such a man. God does. It's a great salvation because it's open to anybody who will come. And Jesus said, whosoever will come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Great salvation because it reaches the lowest sinner. Paul said this is a faithful saying, it's worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, chiefest of sinners. And so how shall we escape if we neglect this great salvation? There is no escape. And then he says concerning this great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. It was Jesus who began to talk about this salvation. It was Jesus who said, I have come to seek and to save those who were lost. It was Jesus who said, that whosoever believeth in me will not perish but have everlasting life. It was Jesus who said, he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die, for I am the resurrection and the life. This great salvation, great because it isn't just deliverance or forgiveness of sins, but it is the hope and the promise of the eternal glory of God's kingdom, promised to us by Jesus Christ. And so, first began to be spoken of by our Lord. And then it was confirmed unto us by those that heard him. John said, 
that which we have seen and that which we have heard declare we unto you. And so first spoken of by Jesus and then confirmed by the apostles who had heard the words of Jesus, wrote them down for our benefit, and thus they confirmed what Jesus had said concerning this great salvation. And then God also, bearing them witness, they bore witness of Jesus, God bore witness of the truth of what they were saying. How did he bear witness? With the signs and the wonders and the diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Read the book of Acts. And the miracles that you read in the book of Acts were given as God's divine affirmation that the message that the disciples were giving was true. They were saying that Jesus was still alive, that he rose from the dead, and he was still at work in the world, working now through his apostles. The same works that Jesus did were now being done by the apostles. Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also, and even greater works than these shall you do, because I go to my Father. And so the works of Jesus were now being wrought by the apostles, and thus God was confirming their message that Jesus still can heal, Jesus still can save. Jesus still can reach out to the needy heart and life. In the book of Acts, we do read of how Peter and John were going into the temple, the lame man who was healed, and how when they were questioned, as to what means this was done, they gave testimony that Jesus was alive and that it was through him and through faith in him and through the faith of him that this lame man was able to walk. God was confirming. In Mark, Gospel chapter 16, where Jesus commissioned the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall so follow them that believe. And so we read, and they went everywhere preaching the word, the Lord working with them, confirming the word, or the Holy Spirit working with them, confirming the word with the signs and with the miracles. So the works that Jesus did, he said, the works that I do shall ye do also, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father. So they went out confirming the words of Jesus, testifying of the great salvation that Jesus had brought to man, and God then was confirming their word with the signs and the miracles and the wonders that were, do, that were being wrought by the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit through them. Notice the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. In the 12th chapter of the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, where Paul is writing to the Corinthian church about the proper use of the gifts of the Spirit. Paul speaks about the Holy Spirit dividing these gifts to every man as he wills. The sovereignty of the Holy Spirit in the dispensing of the gifts of the Spirit. At the end of chapter 12, he tells us to covet earnestly the best gifts, but yet the gifts of the Spirit are imparted by His will. I may covet a gift, but never receive it. It is imparted by His will. And so here, the Lord was working 
with the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. This world to come whereof we speak is, of course, the kingdom age. When the Lord is going to come and establish his kingdom on the earth, the kingdom of which we speak. He hasn't put it in subjection to the angels. They're not the ones that will be ruling over the world in the kingdom age. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visited him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, and you did set him over the works of thy hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. So he now quotes from the eighth psalm, where the psalmist begins, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man? that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, and you did set him over the works of your hands. Now, in the psalm, Psalm 8, as you read Psalm 8, in the 8th psalm, it would appear that God is speaking of man. There is no hint of the Messiah in the 8th psalm. But he's talking about man who was created a little lower than the angels. And God said to Adam, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, every, over the earth. And, and God gave to man dominion over the earth. And so in the psalm, it would appear that he is speaking of just man. But here the writer is interpreting by the Holy Spirit that psalm. And it is a fuller reference to Jesus who became a man. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. That he might suffer death. In order that he might through death deliver us from the power of Satan and from the penalty of our sin. So the writer to the Hebrews makes this apply to Jesus, made it a lower lord than the angels, but crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. Philippians chapter 2, Wherefore let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery or something to be grasped with, to be equal with God, yet he humbled himself or emptied himself, and he came in the likeness of man and was obedient unto in the form of a servant, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. You have it here. Made a little lower than the angels, but yet crowned him with glory and honor, and did set him over the work of thy hands. So Jesus is Lord, and one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that truth. Sooner or later, your knee will bow to him, and you will confess that Jesus is Lord. Sooner is better. If you wait until it's a forced confession, it will not have any redemptive power. By confessing it now, by submitting now to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, it's salvation. 
If thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Later, it will not be to salvation. It'll be a forced confession. You'll have to acknowledge it, but it will not be a saving confession at that time. So God has crowned him with glory and honor. Jesus said, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world ever was. And the Father responded, I have glorified thee and I will glorify thee again. So he has set him now over the works of his hands. For thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet as uh, the promise of the Father to the Son in Psalm 2, uh, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So God is going to put all things under him. He will be Lord over all. God has put all things in subjection under him, and he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. The time has not yet come when Jesus is reigning. <laughs> there are those that say we are in the millennium now. I hope not. <laughs> I was hoping for better things in the kingdom of God. Uh, I, I think it's a rather tragic, sad thing to think that this is the kingdom. You know, we're in the millennium now. Uh, no, Jesus is going to come and he will establish the kingdom of God. And it will not be established until he does come. We are in the pre-tribulation days. And surely we are moving rapidly toward the time of God's judgment to come upon the earth. The Bible speaks of the cup of the wrath of his indignation overflowing. I am certain that as God looks at the earth today, even as he looked at Sodom and Gomorrah, that he says it's time to judge and I'm sure that the cup is full and just about ready to overflow, which, of course, will take place in the great tribulation period where the cup of the wrath of God's indignation does overflow upon those that are still upon the earth at that time. So we do not yet see all things in subjection unto him. Satan is still ruling over the world. It is still under his control and under his power. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, Satan will give to the Antichrist his power, his authority, his throne, and the Antichrist will rule over the world, empowered by Satan. That has not yet taken place. That will take place soon. Jesus came to redeem the world back to God. He paid the price of redemption, but he has not yet claimed that which he purchased. So God has put all things in subjection under him, but we do not yet see all things in subjection. Satan, you remember, took Jesus into a high mountain, showed him the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and said, all of these I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me, for they are mine and I can give them to whomever I will. Satan is bragging. The world belongs to me. It's mine. And I can give it to whomever I will. Give it to you on one condition. Bow down and worship me. It's yours. 
Jesus had come for the purpose of redeeming the earth back to God. Satan is volunteering to give it up without a fight. Just bow down and worship me and it can be yours. One day, Satan will turn the earth over to this man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. And thus, Jesus has not yet assumed the authority and the power that is his. Satan is still ruling over the world today. That is why it is so wrong to blame God for the things that are happening in our world. God has given man free choice. And man exercising his free choice can elect to have evil rule over him. Evil men to rule over him. Immoral men to rule over him. If man wants that, God has given to man that choice. He has allowed him that freedom of choice. Satan rules right now. And of course, it's becoming more obvious every day as we see the corruption that is in the world. But we Christians have the glorious hope that the day is coming not very far off when Jesus will rule and he will establish the kingdom of God. And at that point, all things will be put in subjection under him. Satan will be bound and cast into the abuso. And Jesus will reign over the earth, the glorious kingdom of God, ruling and reigning. But right now, it's not yet so. We do not yet see all things put under him. But what we see is Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He had to become a man in order to die. As God, he could not die. The God-man. As God, death could not hold him. But as man, he died. He died for our sins, and so he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. But he is crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Therein is the grace of God manifested in such a marvelous way. Jesus tasted of death for you. He bore your sins and the penalty of your sins. He was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. You, like sheep, had gone astray. You'd turned to your own ways, but God laid on him the iniquities of us all. And I shouldn't say you, we, us, me. He bore my sins. He died in my place. He tasted of death for me. That I don't have to taste of death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And if you live and believe in me, you'll never die. You say, Chuck, you think you're going to live forever? Yes, I do. <laughs> Not in this body, God forbid. <laughs> you see, in the Bible, death, true death, is separation from God. Conscious separation from God. The Bible also defines the other death, the separation of your consciousness from your body. But it speaks about those who are living in pleasure for pleasure are dead while they're still alive. And you hath he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead to God and to the things of God. In times past, you were walking according to the course of this world. You were under the power of the prince of darkness. And you were by nature the children of wrath even as others because you were ruled by the desires of your flesh and the desires of your mind. But God who is rich in his mercy wherein he has loved us sent his son who tasted death for us. And thus I will never be separated from God. 
one day I'll, my, my spirit will be separated from this body. I'm hoping by rapture route. <laughs> but if not, by whatever route God pleases, my spirit will be separated from the body. But to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so I'll never be separated from God. I've been made alive in Christ Jesus. He tasted of death for me. That I don't have to taste of death. I don't have to be separated from God. Because he bore my sins. He died for my sins. He paid the penalty for my sins, which was death. The wages of sin is death, but he paid the price. And therefore, he became a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he might taste death for every man by the grace of God. For it became him, or it was, it was necessary for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Uh, this is what Paul wrote to the Colossians, that he was the creator of all things, spiritual, physical, whether they're in heaven and earth, and by him and for him were all things made. He is not only the creator, but he is the object of creation. They were for him. So it became him for whom are all things and by whom. It's they're for him, they're by him. In bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation complete through the sufferings. So Jesus is called the captain of our salvation. Uh, the, uh, the leader, the um, as the originator, the initiator of our salvation. Uh, the, the first and of, of the, well, the originator, and the rest follow, but he is the originator of their salvation. The Greek word is, is, is trying to think of how best to translate it, but probably, um, well, um, The, what is it, the colonel's chicken or something? <laughs> he was the originator <laughs> of the recipe. And, and then others followed. And so you can buy the Kentucky Fried Chicken all over the world, you know. Uh, but they were following after, you know, the 17 secret ingredients in the... <laughs> Uh, flavors that he put to the things, but he's the one that started it. And so with Jesus, he's the originator. He, and, and we are following after the captain of our salvation. Uh, so it was uh, to bring many sons, to bring us into the family of God. He paid the price by the grace of God. And the whole purpose was to make you a part of God's glorious family, to make us heirs together with him in the kingdom of God. And the captain of our salvation became complete through sufferings, who for the suffering of death, enduring the cross, though he despised the shame. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Through the grace of God, we've been made one. Jesus said, in that day you will know that I am in the Father, that you are in me, I am in you. Partakers of Jesus Christ. How glorious that is one together in him. For in Christ Jesus there is neither Jew nor Greek, barbarian, Scythian, bond, or free. For Christ is all and in all. We've been made one together in him. 
both he that sanctifieth, he's the one that sanctifies us, and we who have been sanctified are all of one, for which cause he's not ashamed to call us his brothers. His disciples, he said, I no longer call you servants, but I call you brothers. Servant doesn't know what his master is doing. He's not ashamed to call us brothers, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation or the church will I sing praise unto thee. Uh, this is a quotation, of course, from the Psalms and uh, or from actually Isaiah in the Septuagint translation of the uh, But uh, the, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church, I will sing unto thee. We talked last Wednesday night about, uh, and, and this is uh, gathering my thoughts, it's Psalm 22 that he said, I'll declare uh, the name among the brethren. That's in the latter part of Psalm 22, which is that uh, Psalm of the crucifixion begins, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? I cry in the daytime and thou hearest not in the night season and I'm not silent, but thou art holy, O thou. So that's the Psalm that came out of Psalm 22. Uh, I'll declare thy name uh, unto my brethren. And in the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto thee. We mentioned Wednesday night how that um, so often we seek to express love in a song. Somehow it seems like if you sing it, it is more meaningful than just saying it. Uh, I don't know, love songs, you know. And if a person can sing of their love, it, it seems to be more impressive than just declaring it. Now, it here speaks of Jesus singing unto us in the church, in the congregation. Now, we gather, we sing unto him. We sing, you know, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice, and we sing of our love to him, and it, it's meaningful, it, it's very worshipful as we lift our voices in, in song together of praise and love, expressions of our love. But to me, it's always just sort of a wonderful, exciting thing to think of him singing to me. Yeah, that's sort of exciting that he would sing of his love for me. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children of which God has given me. Interesting how the author here just goes from one passage to another passage, and again and again and again, as he is just bringing the various passages from the Old Testament, which were no doubt hidden in his heart. I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, that is, our bodies are made of flesh and blood. We're the children, flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same. He came in a body of flesh. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. There was an early heresy in the church known as Gnosticism. And basically, the Gnostics taught that everything that was material was evil. The only good is that which is spiritual. It had two effects. One, because everything material is evil, it doesn't 
matter what you do with and in the flesh because it's all evil anyhow. And so the, there was a great liberalism as far as you can do anything because it's all, your flesh is evil and everything of the flesh is evil, so it doesn't matter. The other was, of course, uh, the, the total denial or the attempt to deny the flesh and uh, much as uh, uh, the goal of the Buddhist is to have absolutely no material desires and enter into nirvana, pure spirit. But um, the uh, Gnostics taught that Jesus could not have had a physical body because everything material is evil. And so they began to make up sort of legends and stories of how that when Jesus would walk with the disciple on the sandy beach, if you would look carefully, you would only see one set of footprints. Jesus didn't leave footprints because he was a phantom. Uh, he was just an apparition. He, he wasn't a, 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 you know, a reality. There, he had no physical body because how could he be God and have a physical body? And, and thus the denial of Jesus having come in the flesh. But here again is the affirmation, not only did John say, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, but uh, because the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise took part of the same. That is, he took upon himself a body of flesh that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil. It was through death that Jesus conquered over the devil and the forces of darkness. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul speaks of how he spoiled the principalities and powers that are against us triumphing over them in his cross and making an open display of his victory through it. The cross is a place of victory for the child of God. For there through death he destroyed the power of Satan. The power of death because of sin. That was destroyed through the death of Jesus. Now, going back to we do not yet see all things in subjection unto him, along with this, he destroyed him that had power over death, even the devil. You remember when Saul had disobeyed God and the prophet Samuel came to him and said, because you have not allowed God to rule over you, God will no longer allow you to rule over his people. He's taking the kingdom from you. And he went to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse, and by the direction of God, he anointed David to be the king over Israel. But if you remember the story, David didn't immediately take the throne. He is now God's anointed king. But he's not on the throne. Actually, he's being pursued by Saul all over the country. He's fleeing like a partridge in the mountains, being chased by Saul like a partridge through the mountains. And though he is God's anointed king, Saul has been dethroned as far as God is concerned. The kingdom has been taken from him. Yet Saul is doing his best by force to hang on to something that no longer rightfully belongs to him. Thus, the power that Saul presently has is usurped power. The true king is David, God's anointed is David. The kingdom is his. But Saul is trying to hang on to it. 
you have a similar situation. The kingdom is our Lord's. He purchased it. He's God's anointed king. But Satan is seeking to hold by force that which is no longer rightfully his. Jesus paid the price to redeem the world back to God. Satan is hanging on and doing his best to drive Jesus out of the kingdom. Doing a pretty good job. Driving Jesus out of the public life in the United States, once known worldwide as a Christian nation. And yet now, through the edicts of the courts and so forth, Christ is being eliminated out of the public eye, uh, ruling against uh, all kinds of uh, biblical things. So, yet the time came when Saul was destroyed and David reigned. And the time is coming soon when Satan's power will be stripped. He will be bound with a great chain and placed in the abuso. And Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth her successive courses run. So, as the children are made of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through the death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through the fear of death were all of their lifetime subject to bondage. The bondage that man experiences because of the fear of death. But for the child of God, no longer a fear of death. Because Jesus has removed the sting. As Paul said in the end of his letter to the Corinthians, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? For the sting of death was sin, and the power of sin was in the law. But thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he has destroyed that power that Satan was holding people and holding us in bondage in the fear of death, having conquered death for us. For verily, truly, he took not on him the nature of angels. He didn't come as a spirit being. But he took on him the seed of Abraham. That is, he was born as one of the descendants of Abraham, as God promised unto Abraham, through his seed all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. And he understood that to mean that the Messiah would come, which Jesus did through the seed of Abraham. Wherefore? In all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brothers. He's not ashamed to call us of his brothers, but it was necessary that he be made like unto his brothers, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things that pertain to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself also has suffered being tempted he is able to succor them that are tempted. He became, as a man, he experienced temptation. The Bible tells us how that Satan tempted him to use his divine powers for his own personal gain, turn the bread into, or the stones into bread. Feed your own appetites with your divine powers. Create a sensation and a spectacle to draw attention to yourself that people might know you're the Messiah. Jump off the pinnacle of the temple. Look, I'll give you all of the kingdoms of the world. Just bow down and worship me. And these temptations 
the temptation for glory, the temptation to exercise power for our own benefit. He experienced these things. He knows what it's like. And because of that, he is able to help us to understand us, to make reconciliation for us who are tempted, having gone through and experienced what we go through. Yet he was, of course, apart from sin, but yet he becomes then a faithful high priest. He can go to the Father to represent me. He comes to me to represent the Father. That was the duty of the priest. The priest would go before God to represent the people. He would come to the people as God's representative. And so Jesus is our great high priest, gone into heaven for us, there to make reconciliation, but able to do so because he suffered temptation like we do. He knows what it's like. He knows what it is to be in the frailties of a body of flesh, he knows what it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be thirsty. He knows what it is to have these desires of the flesh and how strong they can become. And thus he can understand us, sympathize with us, and represent us properly as our great high priest because he became a man in a body of flesh to experience the things that we go through in order to better represent us before the Father. It just gets gooder and gooder <laughs> as we go into the book of Hebrews. So next week, read on. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, who came in a body of flesh that he might taste of death for all men, that through death he might destroy him who had power over death, even the devil. Lord, we thank you that he was willing to undergo all of these things in order to represent us before you. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your glorious gift of eternal life. Thank you, Father, for the hope of the kingdom to come. And we pray, Lord, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done here on this earth, even as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory